This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So let me ask for the surgeons in the room who do bypass surgery, how many use heparinized blood as their vein harvest solution? Does anyone use heparinized blood? One. How many use normal saline with heparin? How many use some other type of crystalloid solution with heparin? Okay, let's get into it. Um, no disclosures. Amazingly, we've been doing this operation for uh, more than 60 years, that is taking a vein and transplanting it into, into a, an artery. And I just want to point out that it is actually a tissue transplant. It's an auto transplant. We're taking the vein, we're harvesting it, harvesting it from its bed, and then we're creating a, an arterial conduit. This is the original paper by Dr. Kunlin from France, and then one of my mentors, Dr. Maddock, was talking about tibial bypass back in 1964, 50 years later. We've advanced the technique a little bit, but we really haven't dramatically um, changed some of the basic limitations of it. So it is an unsolved problem. If we look at the data, between 20 and 40 percent will have a primary patency issue, whether that's a revision or an occlusion within the first year. And although the cardiac surgeons never really wanted to face it because they put so many graphs in they can't figure out what actually happened. But when you look on a graft level, it's actually quite similar between lower extremity bypass and cabbage. Uh, we know that early graft injury during harvest, particularly endothelial damage, plays an important role. And then the vein, which is, exists as a low pressure, low shear conduit, is exposed to this burst of biomechanical forces in the arterial environment, both pressure and shear flow. And then there's an inflammatory response that accompanies all of this. The idea, perhaps, is that the optimal technique, the optimal harvest, and the optimal storage solution would minimize the injury to the vein, just like any other transplanted organ, preserve the structure and function in the metabolic state. But we really don't have much pharmacotherapy for vein graft failure other than antiplatelets right now. Every single bypass series that you look at in the literature looks the same. It's got this kind of curve. This happens to be the Brigham over 20 years. I just want to point out that there's three phases to this curve. The first phase of failure within the first 30 days, generally in the range of 5 to 8 percent. We always call this technical, but it's not so much a technical mishap as some of the factors that you have to deal with, whether it's a poor quality conduit or a difficult target. Then there's this uh, steeper, this, uh, I'm sorry, this area within the first uh, 18 to 24 months uh, where is really the occurrence of de novo lesions within the conduit or neoenomal hyperplasia within the vein that we can see with ultrasound surveillance. And when we detect severe lesions, we can re-intervene. And then uh, we wonder how much these play into each other, how much of what we started out with, how we handle that vein how much of the technical stuff is what triggers or augments the enamel hyperplasia. I think that's, it's clear that, that that is related. Then later on, the curve tends to flatten off a bit. We see about a 5% event rate per year after two years, which is primarily related to further neointima, but also atherosclerosis. And there may be, and there is a relationship between the neointima that forms in the graft and the subsequent deposition of plaque and cholesterol. So it all starts at time zero, and we get to choose time zero in this particular operation. We're not dealing with a disease conduit most of the time. We're dealing with a healthy vein. But this is the, these are the mechanisms of early vein graft injury. When we harvest the vein, we handle it, we stretch it, we put it under torsion, we distend it, sometimes we overpressurize it. It then undergoes some variable amount of warm ischemia and reperfusion. And then depending on the harvest solution, what we expose it to may be different in osmolarity and pH. All of this ischemia uh, and stress produces reactive oxygen species. For varying amounts of time, there may be a lack of nutrients to the conduit. And then there may even be direct toxins. In fact, surgical skin markers, the ones that are most commonly used, are alcohol-based. They are directly toxic to the cells and to the tissue. And then it finally, after all of that, 
we implant it into this turbulent, uh, high-pressure environment. Uh, this is a, a cartoon we made a number of years ago when we were thinking about how to develop a way to address this problem. We can't do much about people who have some pre-existing disease in their vein. As soon as we start, as we mentioned, we have ischemia and reperfusion. We have endothelial injury, which takes generally a week or two to recover. We have early platelets and thrombus, microthrombus that develops. But then we have this period of smooth muscle cell growth and proliferation, and then later matrix and lipid. And underneath all of this, the vein has to adapt to the hemodynamic environment, which means it has to develop a certain amount of thickening to reduce wall stress. Most of the work in the field, of course, is focused around this. If we could reduce this to some degree, we could reduce neointima formation. But a lot of the stage is set by what happens early, which is what we're talking about now. We've had this idea for a long time that if we could re-engineer the whole conduit right at the time of implantation, maybe we could improve this healing response. And you could think of a number of things you could do while you have that access to that conduit. You could improve the metabolism or protect the biochemistry of the vein. Anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, and anti-proliferative drugs, compounds, or genes all might be relevant to trying to address the subsequent healing response. This was actually the subject of my very, very first grant back when I was young, and this was the Prevent 3 trial in which we actually uh, took the vein harvest solution and we added to it a drug, which was actually a novel molecular therapy trying to block cell cycle growth and scar tissue formation. You could do this on the back table in 10 minutes. This was a way of modifying the vein harvest solution Unfortunately, it didn't work. We did not see any uh, evidence that it reduced the incidence of, of de novo vein graft lesions between the controls treated and the oligonucleotide treated, and uh, overall incidence was 25%, and neither did they see it in the coronary study. Again, notably about the same incidence per graft of one-year graft failure. So the failure of this was really quite disappointing. These were two large trials, 1,400 and over 3,000 patients, uh, we had the hope that we would be able to raise the whole level of vein graft disease, and to date we haven't been able to replace this quite yet. The cardiac surgeons have spent the most time looking at this. They've looked a lot at different solutions, and all the data basically suggests that a buffered solution does much better than either heparinized blood or plain old saline. I don't want to give too much biochemistry, but plain old saline has absolutely no buffering capacity in it. You add a drug or anything to it, it rapidly becomes acidic. Studies have gone on for 30 years showing what happens. The endothelium doesn't like it. It sloughs and ruffles, and you have microthrombi and leukocytes. Way back in 1984, Dr. Legerfo was one of the leaders in vascular surgery. He looked at how do you minimize the injury to the graft with sort of a no-touch technique. He looked at two solutions. You know, one was plasmolite, which was balanced salt and papaverin and heparin, and he sort of infiltrated it, and then he also stored it in a similar solution where he added some albumin, and this was his optimum approach at that time. But he also paid very close attention to not overpressurizing the conduit. It turns out that with our typical handheld distension, we can generate pressures of seven and 800 millimeters of mercury within the vein, which is damaging to the endothelium. So he created this little reservoir system that prevented you from overpressurizing the conduit. And, you know, some of these things that were figured out long ago have been forgotten in everyday practice. I think we injure the conduit quite a lot, uh, and we're not really paying attention to the details. Actually, the Prevent 4 cabbage study looked, was able to look at the effects of different preservatives in the cabbages. They had some in saline, 44%, some in blood, and some in buffered saline. And at the end of the day, they found that the use of the buffered saline or the plasmolite type solution was associated with not only a lower risk of revascularization, but a lower risk for myocardial infarction and death in this population. And you can see on this slide that buffered saline solutions, this is not expensive and not complicated. This is basically plasmolite or phosphate buffered saline. Um, so vein graft storage solutions, again, heparinized saline is acidic. The pH, if you measure it, stick a piece of litmus paper in it, you'd be surprised. Sometimes it's five, five and a half. Uh, if you add a vasodilator to plasmolite, that's what I commonly do. There's a range of solutions that are out there. There's some interesting ones that are out there, including things that have been used for organ transplant. You can't actually infuse these actually into the body, of course, like UW solution. Gala solution is very interesting. It's a, basically a buffered saline in, to which is added ascorbate arginine and, and an oxidant uh, uh, reactive oxygen sink, glutathione. 
Uh, and of course, paying, control, paying attention to pressure control, uh, Dr. Brophy and her colleagues have been looking at all of these factors quite a lot in terms of loss of contractile function, loss of endothelial function in grafts that are prepared with a careful technique where you control the pressure and limit it to 300 millimeters of mercury versus no control. And they came up with this very simple little pop-off valve device, which you can actually get now, which keeps the pressure reduced, this pressure release valve, will keep the pressure under 200. If you don't have it, routinely surgeons are generating pressures of over 800 in the conduits. They measured this in a series of cases and showed that they could better preserve the function of the vein, these are pig veins, when we didn't overpressurize the system. Uh, and again, so some new solutions that might be considered that need to be demonstrated in clinical trials. This GALA solution had a high rate of preservation of endothelium, even with long storage times. So I'll end by saying this is what I do. Uh, try to minimize the harvest trauma. I don't disconnect the vein till I'm pretty much ready to implant it uh, as a bypass. I try to be as gentle as possible, not only not because I don't want to uh, minimize the ischemia time with dividing the vein, but you never know exactly how much you need until you made your arteriotomies. I don't really use endoscopic harvest primarily because it's, it's uh, uncommon that it's a situation where it would really save time. I think it's important to be gentle with distension, use a buffered solution. We use papaverin and heparin in plasmalite, and the role of other additives is, is unclear, but an area of, of investigation. Thanks.